Janice Sachse of Baton Rouge is a brilliant American artist whose works hang in many of the fine museums of the world, and she's also a dear friend. I asked her uh, uh, whether or not I could tell you her age, and she said that she was 76 going on 96. Uh, I think you'll find that she's a remarkable, bright, articulate woman. Janice, welcome to Louisiana Legends. Thank you for having me. Yes. You were born in New Orleans, Janice Rubenstein. That's right. And uh, when did you move to Baton Rouge? When I was five. Five years old. Yes. I, I remember Baton Rouge as, as a very small town. And we lived just two houses from the university on 3rd Street. Did you have many neighbors? Oh, sure. I, by that, I mean it was so small in those days, you know. Uh, well, there were 15,000 people in Baton 15. Rouge at that time. Mm -hmm. Janice, uh, your family, both your mother and father, absolutely had influence on, on, on the artistic life that you have lived. Tell, tell us about that influence. Well, uh, my father was uh, an interior decorator at the Paris Exposition in uh, 90, I mean, uh, 1902, I believe it was, or, it, or maybe two years before the beginning of the century. And my mother was artistic in everything that she did. But my father collected art, and I have some of it in my house. He, he belonged to a family that was uh, educated, and, and uh, I suppose that's where I got it. But I had an uncle who lived next door, an uncle and aunt. And my uncle, uh, 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 Jonas Wilde, subscribed to L'Illustration, the French gravure. And I saw that every month when it came. And I was well acquainted with all of the beautiful, the fine paintings of the world without even being able to read the language that they were printed in so that I knew well that visually everyone can enjoy art. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here amused because you're such a distinguished lady that I'm going to let our audience in on a little secret. You once got kicked out of University High School in Baton Rouge. Now, mm -hmm. let's set the stage. It's 1925. Calvin Coolidge occupies the White House. Janice Sachs, he's a student at University High. What happened? Well, there was, a, there was a principal by the name of Mr. Shoptaw. He had a very deep dimple in his chin and a very unusual nose. And I drew his portrait on the blackboard for the last time. <laughs> How did your parents uh, react to your educational career being terminated? Well, I don't remember <laughs> a single remark that they made about it. But they did get me into Baton Rouge High School for the last two years of my college, of my high school. But when I came home the first day from Baton Rouge High School, they said, my mother said, now we have made arrangements for you to have art lessons every afternoon after school. And after the, school. <laughs> after school, and there will be no uh, excuses about doing it. And I had a marvelous two years with a, a lady who was a graduate of Newcomb and we drew from casts, and I was able to have, she had a platform for uh, students to come, for uh, models, and I was already two years into it, seriously, when I graduated from the Baton Rouge High School. Uh, you attended both LSU and Newcomb College, and yes. graduated from neither. What happened? Well, I was at LSU for two years, and I felt that I wanted more, high, more college work, I mean more art work. But my father was not well at that time. And I did go to Newcomb for one year. And when I returned, uh, my father died shortly thereafter. In 1929, you married a, a brilliant young attorney, uh, one of uh, 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 this country's uh, 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 most renowned attorneys, uh, the late uh, Victor Sachse. How did you all meet? We, we were always friends. I sat on the front swing with him. So his childhood? A child, uh, yes, and when my father was ill, we, I was in New York with him, and I had an opportunity to marry someone else. And, and he said to me at that time, I'm ill, and you're the eldest child. I want you to marry. And, and I said, well, how about Victor? <laughs> and he said, well, I haven't even considered him. <laughs> So, so y'all settled on Victor. I, Victor was at the train to meet the <laughs> to meet me when we came in, and uh, Fanny Bailey, who was was on that train trip, she's she's she was now, she's now Mrs. Reno. Uh, 
she, she saw Victor come up and kiss me, and she said, what has happened? <laughs> anyway, I'm still very friendly with her. You settled in at the art department at LSU, and your main teacher was the muralist Conrad Albricio. That's right. What did you learn from him? Well, I learned that, uh, I learned everything I know from him, really, in, in art. But he was so hard on me that I thought I would get him and his wife to come home and have dinner with Victor and me because I wanted Victor to annihilate him. <laughs> and they fell in love with each other. <laughs> and it was a, an ongoing friendship all the way through. But he, I did take two full majors at the university in the art department. And uh, I am a painter. You know, uh, some folks might not realize that Baton Rouge enjoyed a golden period of intellectual vitality, and it was that period. For example, you all had a group that contained Robert Penn Warren, the great poet, the great novelist, the well, great we critic. We had mutual friends, too. Cleanth Warren Brooks, did. the literary critic. There was you, there was Victor, there was Albrizio. I was not a friend of Cleanth Brooks, but Victor did. But didn't was you all get some. together? Yes, we, we were there. Yes, but I couldn't claim Cleanth Brooks, really. Victor did. But that's amazing, mm -hmm. though, that, that, that this group uh, flourished at the LSU. And, and, and well, there were lots of intellectuals at LSU, and my husband was among them. He was the top graduate in his law class, and he'd always been, he taught law at the university for some years also. So. Had you not married, just not married, which was a possibility. No possibility. No possibility. No. Daddy wasn't going to have it. That's right. <laughs> no possibility. How times Science. have changed, huh? That's right. Uh, you accompanied Victor, who was a captain in the Judge Corps, Advocate Corps, and lived in Washington for five years, I think, That's in and right. around Washington. And then that was when I came into my own as a painter because while he had to go through the war and we had financial problems there, I was exposed to the museums in Washington and I didn't miss it. And Conrad was there too. He and Jean were in Washington. Conrad. Albrizio. Yes, Albrizio. And I'd, I had five years of deprivation as a war wife with two small children, but I had the beautiful experience of living in a place where I could see the, the art of the world. And then all the German Expressionist people were pouring in, you see. and Refugees uh, from re Germany. Yes, yes, from Germany. And uh, I don't need to mention one of them because I'd have to mention 30 or 40, and they're all well known. But I, this is where I came into my own. Now, Janice, when news begin to come out of Germany of the Holocaust, of the uh, uh, murder of innocent men, women, and children, this had a profound effect on you for a couple of years, didn't it? You stopped painting. On everybody. But you stopped painting. I, I simply was not emotionally up to it. You don't, I wasn't painting just to sell paintings. I was painting to leave a record of my thoughts and my experiences and my emotional life. And the only way that I knew to do that was to just uh, was to be a regional painter. I didn't want world affairs, but I had learned them the hard way. Here, this might be a good time for a question that I've wondered about. What is professionalism in art? What, what, how do you define this business of professionalism as opposed to the amateur who goes out with watercolor? Well, in the first place, Gus, I think that it is impossible for a person to make his living selling art without, without uh, sacrificing himself. It just isn't in the cards. You, you emotionally would simply have to please an audience. Uh, uh, the buyers have something go over the couch that fit and so forth. And this was not where I wanted to do. I wanted to delve into art itself and come up with a personal statement that I could stand by. And it had to be regional because having married and having two children and having my husband an attorney didn't give me an opportunity to to travel greatly, and I had all of the experience of the museums in Washington, as well as seeing the refugees come in and the marvelous things they were doing in their angry way. Uh, I must ask you this. Uh, being married to a very successful attorney, uh, 
and, and, and therefore, unlike some artists, knowing where your next meal was coming from, did that influence you much? In other words, you, didn't, you did not have to paint to make a living. That was removed from your needs. So did that affect It influenced you? me greatly, and, and I was thankful to God that I was in this position because I knew that if I was just going to paint to, to please the public, I wasn't going to do anything but a commercial job. Now, the university professors are aware it is. If I'm going, the first collections that I made were of the people who were teaching art at, a, at college level because they were giving of themselves to teach people and they had time only to do what they, they, they were paid for what they were doing and their, their uh, financial gain uh, did not come altogether from that and their work therefore excelled. Years down the road when you and, and, and a lot of the rest of us will no longer be here and someone looks at a painting by Janice Saxe, what do you want them, what, what, what do you want that painting to say about you, about the artist? I want the painting to speak to the person who's looking at it and I want the emotional situation to be between that person and the painting. I don't love my paintings after I've done them. I want them to be in proper places. And I have won a great many, um, what do they call it, um, purchase prizes. And that's the saddest thing that can happen. Even here in Louisiana, that happens to me. They, take, they give you $1,000 for a painting always, for a purchase prize. And then the painting doesn't belong to you. It's put in a closet somewhere. And because the real atten attention is given to the people who have gained admission to the exhibition, you yes. see. Now, a, a professional painter is not one who can paint a painting that can go over your couch nicely and look well in the room. It, a professional painter is one who seeks admission to museum exhibitions, which most of the professors do, and which are accepted as, uh, as a quality to go into the show, you see. The ones who don't get in can try again. I once had a lady say to me, you know, I'm a professional painter because I sold $700 worth of work this year. Yes. And I said, if you'd sold $20,000 worth of work this year, it wouldn't make you a professional painter if you couldn't pass into museums, museums. With a sl with, by judging. Where works will endure. Well, it, it's a, not a matter of keeping the works in the museums, Gus. It's a matter of being admitted to the exhibition that you're trying to get into. It goes back to you afterwards. But if you can't get into these exhibitions that are in museums, you are not professional. Most of the college, uh, uh, the people who teach in the universities are the real professional painters because they not only have had the education, but they can uh, project it, and they do get into uh, good exhibitions. Do you remember uh, the first time you were thus so accepted in an exhibition? I don't remember because I, I, I've been in so many in, in a whole lot of them. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of your uh, exquisite and interesting paintings. Tell us about this painting. Well, now you're going <laughs> you'll be surprised, Gus. All right. It has a great deal. The painting has a great many. Uh, places where it where it's it's unreal the 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 chairs crushed into the corner and things the plates you couldn't possibly eat out of something like that and I brought it to an ophthalmologist to show it to him because I was getting cataracts and I said this is what cataracts can do to your <laughs> I asked him to show it to the rest of the people in his office but they wouldn't look at it but there was a witness some lady was there and has since talked to me about it well, that painting uh, is, is classified as painterly. Now, I don't want to have to go into what painterly well, is. Well, just in layman's terms, what does that mean? Uh, painterly means that it comes from your heart and it's not necessarily true, but it, that everything makes a, a, a fine painting. When I was taken into the American Society of Contemporary Painters, I'm the only Southern member, and some coincidences have to occur for things to happen to you, but you still have to have the goods. 
you, it doesn't happen just by coincidence. You have to have the proper things that make it so. And uh, at the the uh, I I sent the painting to to New York into the American Society of Contemporary Painters, which is, by the way, a tax-exempt organization fully accredited by the United States government for what it does. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I went with Una Wilkinson, who was down here, who lived down here for a number of years, and we, we criticized it. We said, oh, it's, it's hung too high. The light's not right <laughs> on it. Something's wrong. And it was such a big hall it was in. And finally, we went back, and she said, my God, there's an award on that painting. <laughs> and we looked at it, on the, and there was a blue ribbon hanging on oh the my. painting. So I won the first prize. Remarkable. <laughs> now, let It says so on there. It has yes, a little it has a, plate. Now, will you keep that? Obviously, you're not going to. Oh, no. I, 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 uh, I will, it will come to a museum. It, it will be in a museum. In a museum. Now, mm -hmm. let's, uh, uh, now for something I would say violently different and more to my liking, and uh, this business of liking uh, uh, works of art or creative products are, are so individualized. Uh, I'd like to go now to the uh, painting which hangs over our mantelpiece. Now, to look, here's uh, uh, the layman. Uh, it's some lawn furniture, but peculiar lawn furniture, and there's a very peculiar uh, <laughs> a sun uh, uh, just radiating over it. Tell us about that painting. Well, Gus, I was surprised when you came to my house and immediately locked on that painting, because it is one of my very best pieces. I respect it. it. I just let the lawn furniture take root. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> the legs of the lawn furniture uh, uh, it was a hot uh, day appeared to I, be more, that's yes, right. that's right, uh, uh, plant-like. Than, than that's that. right. They, they, I just let them take root. The, this is not intended for people. This is in, intended just to talk about the lawn furniture. And how about that? Uh, 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 those rays uh, coming out well, of the sun? Well, that's to show the heat of the summertime. The heat of the summer. Yeah. Uh, Janice, did Picasso influence your work? He did oh, almost everybody. Oh, of course. Yeah. He was, he's the painter of the 20th century. Yes. I mean, there's, no one has touched him. Let me ask you this. Uh, when I read a very fine writer, uh, I have this terrible habit for a time I write like him or her. It's, it has nothing to do with creativeness. It's totally derivative. Uh, for example, uh, Thomas Wolfe wrecked me. I wrote like Thomas Wolfe, second-rate Thomas Wolfe, for years. Uh, does that happen to artists? Of course. How do you of break it? it does. You don't break it. You just survive with it because you do the man honor that you're searching into the same field that he has been in. But how does the artist uh, 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 find his or her own voice? In other words, at what point do, do the uh, uh, artistic influences of the Picassos and Renoirs and Rembrandts and Klee, at what point do those simmer down and does Janice Sachs's, when does that happen in a career or a lifetime? From the, it happens from the beginning of the career. You don't, you never simmer down. You just, you, you take everything that you see and you use it to your best advantage. And <clears throat> I haven't been able to find anyone that Picasso has touched. I mean, he set the pace for the 20th century and, and as a, painter in a small town here, I'm as well aware of that as anyone else is. And there are lots of painters. I have good uh, associations because I've kept close touch with the university. And I feel that the painters who teach are, and who, ha who teach for their living are more apt to be the important people in this country than, than anyone else. Occasionally there is a, a painter, perhaps a woman, who hasn't had to have that and who can stride forward because she's had the leisure to be able to do it. What counsel do you give to young artists just starting? And I know that they must come from time to time to see you and seek. What, what, uh, 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 John you, Doe wants to paint and has some talent. Let me tell you a funny story. I had a friend who was thinking about buying a small Renoir. And she uh, went into the gallery where they put the Renoir on a red uh, stand, a tripod. And she, she walked over to the Renoir and she took out of her pocketbook a swatch of material. 
And she went over to the Renoir and she held it there. And he said, get out of my gallery. The painting is not for sale. Not for sale. So what, she deserved that. So what do you advise those young painters? What, what, where do they go? What should they I do? I think they should associate with the university professors. I think that is their most valuable association. And I would say that in buying paintings, I buy from as many times from a, a, a background of a professor as any other way, because that is the soundest background. It wasn't a background which I had to have, because I didn't have to, to uh, support myself. Yes, ma'am. But for the ones who did, they have not only the advantage of, of pupils with whom they can associate, but they have the advantage of having had, uh, of having made their way on their own without having to, uh, without having to subjugate their art to, to the, to the lady who wants to see if the, if the curtain will match the, will match the Renoir. Do your children, uh, uh, two sons, uh, both distinguished attorneys, do they paint? Is there any artistic? Uh... Harry is an artist, and Victor is a collector, and they're both collectors of my work. I have a terrible time about my things because they, they glare at each other about it. But, but what a treasure for a child, and it's one that most of us will never be afforded, uh, to, uh, uh, to be able, uh, uh, in years to come, uh, uh, to be able to work, to look at, uh, at, at something out of a parent, out of a parent's soul and heart and well, imagination, because that's where they come from. That's right, and and He's once painting. once I furnished a house, a, an apartment for Victor with my paintings, and then he fell in love with this lady, his present, his wife, whom I love too. But I had a terrible time. I couldn't get any of my paintings back. <laughs> they married the paintings as well as <laughs> each other. Janice, uh, what what are your work habits with painting? What, what when do you paint? All the time in my head. In your head. Yeah. Constantly. It doesn't take me a long time once I address the canvas, but uh, I I paint all all time. Now I don't sell any work at all. I don't sell anything from my house at all. I never have. I've always had an agent. I I never want it any other way because I can afford to have it that way. Yes, ma'am. And. Uh, but when do you actually go to the canvas? In the morning, night, afternoon? When do you? It's always available to me, and I do it as I please. But I'm painting. That's my. That's what I do. I'm a painter, and I prepare a show for once a year. And I don't. It's my. Uh, I'm at the Griffith Menard Gallery. I haven't shown there for almost a year now. You see, but I don't have to. How many paintings are you prepare a show once a year? How many paintings will you attempt to present it at the next show, for example? Oh, 20 or so. 20. Now, do you have in mind now, and this will be very interesting, your next work? Oh, sure. I'm you working do? on it now. Would you mind telling me? I just yeah, yes, I would mind telling you. You don't want to tell me because you're afraid <laughs> I'll go home and paint it. <laughs> uh, let's say that I wasn't a painter, but uh, and I'm not. All right. I'm real <laughs> and I came to you and said, you're 76 years old. You have been a mother, a wife, and a brilliant creative artist. You've traveled. You've had an opportunity to see the world. What has life taught you, I would ask you? What would you answer me? That's a big question, Gus. Well, make like I'm, I'm asking for the reader's digest. Well, uh, I would, first of all, I would thank God that I have uh, not had to uh, witness death with, out of order. When my husband died, it was his time to die. And I thank God that he was gone at that time because his life was finished for him. Yes, ma'am. But other than that, I want to be able to see well enough and hear well enough to indulge myself in my creative work. And I never sell anything from my house. I don't, I don't have any, any clients who come to buy from me. Has painting having this outlet, we were talking before we went on the show that you're blessed. Many people who reach uh, uh, senior years, advanced years, their children have departed uh, very often, as have their mates, uh, uh, gone on. And uh, they're left uh, with, with uh, uh, mostly memories. Has this ability to take your vision of life and go to a canvas and, 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 and record it? Or a paper, it, a piece of paper. Yes, or paper. 
Has has that kept you young and vigorous and vital? I, I don't know. I, this may be a part of my genetic inheritance. I, I, my family, my mother and my brother have, and my father died young, but there were people who lived quite old in my family, and this may be a part of my genetic inheritance, but surely uh, I have been fulfilled by it. Now, I had a painting on the wall, on the stairway, that uh, I started the Interstate series with. Yes. I, I had made up my mind I would never give that painting up because Albrizio, that was the last painting that Albrizio had seen me do before he died. We had the care of him at that yes. time. Well, John Bullitt, who's the director of the New Orleans Museum. We're running out of time. All right. He came and picked up that painting and brought it to the New Orleans Museum. So, you see, you do have uh, a chance to fulfill uh, yourself. I want you to know that uh, on behalf of your fellow Louisianians, uh, thank you for being among us and for the contributions that you have made and for being the remarkable human being that uh, you obviously are. Thank you so much, Janice Sachs. Thank you for having me on the okay. show.